Good morning, my greeters. How are you doing today? I hope you're all great. And we are still on the Growth Mindset Project series. And we are now on episode number two. What we're going to talk about today are the life lessons that we can get from Steve Jobs. But before we dive into it, let's play this. Good morning once again, my greeters. Steve Jobs was able to live a meaningful and colorful life. I was able to capture some of the life lessons he was able to share during his speeches to different types of audience. I was able to watch his commencement speech in Stanford University, and I was able to also watch his visit in the MIT or the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and during the 2011 Santa Clara Valley Historical Association presentation, I was able also to listen to that specific speech. I believe you are now ready. So let's start with number one life lesson or tip that we can get from Steve Jobs. The number one on my list is connect the dots. According to Steve Jobs, you cannot connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards. What does that mean? It means that whatever it is that you are experiencing right now, whatever situation that you are going through right now, you just have to trust the process. You may not know the purpose, why it's happening right now in your life, but someday, somehow, you will get a clearer picture of why it happened. Don't rush finding forward the answers. Sometimes the true real answers take time to find. I dropped out of Reed College after the first six months, but then stayed around as a drop-in for another 18 months or so before I really quit. So why did I drop out? It started before I was born. My biological mother was a young and wed college graduate student, and she decided to put me up for adoption. She felt very strongly that I should be adopted by college graduates. So everything was all set for me to be adopted at birth by a lawyer and his wife. Except that when I popped out, they decided at the last minute that they really wanted a girl. So my parents, who were on a waiting list, got a call in the middle of the night asking, We have an unexpected baby boy. Do you want him? They said, Of course. My biological mother later found out that my mother had never graduated from college and that my father had never graduated from high school. She refused to sign the final adoption papers. She only relented a few months later when my parents promised that I would someday go to college. And 17 years later, I did go to college, but I naively chose a college that was almost as expensive as Stanford. And all of my working class parent savings were being spent on my college tuition. After six months, I couldn't see the value in it. I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life, and I had no idea how college was going to help me figure it out. And here, I was spending all of the money my parents had saved their entire life. So I decided to drop out and trust that it would all work out okay. It was pretty scary at the time, but looking back, it was one of the best decisions I ever made. The minute I dropped out, I could stop taking the required classes that didn't interest me and begin dropping in on the ones that looked interesting. It wasn't all romantic. It didn't have a dorm room, so I slept on the floor in friends' rooms. I returned Coke puddles for the five cents deposits to buy food with, and I would walk the seven miles across town every Sunday night to get one good meal a week at the Hare Krishna Temple. I loved it, and much of what I stumbled into by following my curiosity and intuition turned out to be priceless later on. Let me give you one example. Reed College at the time offered perhaps the best calligraphy instruction in the country. Throughout the campus, 
every poster, every label, and every drawer was beautifully hand calligraphed. Because I had dropped out and didn't have to take the normal classes, I decided to take calligraphy class to learn how to do this. I learned about serif and sans serif type faces, about varying the amount of space between different lyric combinations, about what makes great typography great. It was beautiful, historical, artistically subtle in a way that science can capture, and I found it fascinating. None of this had even a hope of any practical application in my life. But 10 years later, when we were designing the first Macintosh computer, it all came back to me, and we designed it all into the Mac. It was the first computer with beautiful typography. If I had never chopped in on that single course in college, the Mac would have never had multiple typefaces or proportionally spaced fonts. And since Windows just copied the Mac, it's likely that no personal computer would have them. If I had never dropped out, I would have never dropped in on this calligraphy class. And personal computers might not have the wonderful typography that they do. Of course, it was impossible to connect the dots looking forward when I was in college, but it was very, very clear looking backward 10 years later. Again, you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backward. So you have to trust that dots will somehow connect in your future. You have to trust in something, your gut, destiny, life, karma, whatever. This approach has never let me down. It has all made the difference in my life. Number two, find what you love. You can check this vlog that I created a few months ago. It's all about finding your ikigai, your purpose, your life's meaning. Check that out so that you can maximize your potential. At the same time, that's an additional fuel to your motivation so that you can keep going whatever it is that you're doing right now. I was lucky I found what I love to do early in life. Wuz and I started Apple in my parents' garage when I was 20. We worked hard and in 10 years, Apple had grown from just the two of us in a garage into a $2 billion company with over 4,000 employees. We had just released our finest creation, the Macintosh, a year earlier and I had just turned 30. And then I got fired. How can you get fired from a company you started? Well, as Apple grew, we hired someone who I thought was very talented to run the company with me. And for the first year or so, things went well. But then our visions of the future began to diverge. And eventually, we had a falling out. When we did, our board of directors sided with him. So at 30, I was out and very publicly out. What had been the focus of my entire adult life was gone and was devastating. I really didn't know what to do for a few months. I felt I had let the previous generation of entrepreneurs down, that I had dropped the baton as it was being passed to me. I met with David Packard and Bob Noyce and tried to apologize for screwing up so badly. I was a very public failure and I even thought about running away from the valley. But something slowly began to dawn on me. I still loved what I did. The turn of events at Apple had not changed that one bit. I had been rejected, but I was still in love. And so I decided to start over. I didn't see it then, but it turned out that getting fired from Apple was the best thing that could have ever happened to me. The heaviness of being successful was replaced by the lightness of being a beginner again, less sure about everything. It freed me to enter one of the most creative periods of my life. During the next five years, I started a company named Next, another company named Pegzar, and fell in love with an amazing woman who would become my wife. Pixar went on to create the world's first computer animated film Toy Story and is now the most successful animation studio in the world. In a remarkable turn of events, Apple bought Next. I returned to Apple and the technology we developed at Next is at the heart of Apple's current renaissance. 
and Lorraine and I have a wonderful family together. I'm pretty sure none of this would have happened if I hadn't been fired from Apple. It was awful tasting medicine, but I guess the patient needed it. Sometimes life hits you in the head with a brick. Don't lose faith. I'm convinced that the only thing that kept me going was that I loved what I did. You've got to find what you love, and that is as true for your work as it is for your lovers. Your work is going to fill a large part of your life, and the only way to be truly satisfied is to do what you believe is great work. And the only way to do great work is to love what you do. If you haven't found it yet, keep looking. Don't settle. As with all matters of the heart, you'll know when you find it. And like any great relationship, it just gets better and better as the years roll on. So keep looking until you find it. Don't settle. Number three, your time is limited. Don't waste it living someone else's life. How old are you now? 20, 25, 30, 40, 50, 60? Are you happy? Are you living? Are you doing what you love? Do you even know what you love in the first place? I believe it's very important that we know, that we love, we enjoy, that every moment of our life existence. Let us not waste it with toxic social media feeds, toxic people, fake news, and so many more. You've got to listen to what your inner voice is telling you. When I was 17, I read a quote that went something like, if you live each day as if it was your last, someday you'll most certainly be right. It made an impression on me, and since then, for the past 33 years, I have looked in the mirror every morning and asked myself, if today were the last day of my life, would I want to do what I am about to do today? And whenever the answer has been no for too many days in a row, I know I need to change something. Remembering that I'll be dead soon is the most important tool I've ever encountered to help me make the big choices in life. Because almost everything, all external expectations, all pride, all fear of embarrassment or failure, these things just fall away in the face of death, leaving only what is truly important. Remembering that you are going to die is the best way I know to avoid the trap of thinking you have something to lose. You are already naked. There is no reason not to follow your heart. About a year ago, I was diagnosed with cancer. I had a scan at 7.30 in the morning and it clearly showed a tumor on my pancreas. I didn't even know what a pancreas was. The doctors told me this was almost certainly a type of cancer that is incurable and that I should expect to live no longer than three to six months. My doctor advised me to go home and get my affairs in order, which is doctor's code for prepared to die. It means to try to tell your kids everything you thought you'd have the next 10 years to tell them in just a few months. It means to make sure everything is buttoned up so that it will be as easy as possible for your family. It means to say goodbyes. I lived with the diagnosis all day. Later that evening, I had a biopsy where they stuck an endoscope down my throat, through my stomach, and into my intestines, put a needle into my pancreas, and got a few cells from the tumor. I was sedated, but my wife, who was there, told me that when they viewed the cells under a microscope, the doctors started crying because it turned out to be a very rare form of pancreatic cancer that is curable with surgery. I had a surgery, and I'm fine now. This was the closest I've been to facing death, and I hope it's the closest I get for a few more decades. Having lived through it, I can now say this to you with a bit more certainty that when death was a useful but purely intellectual concept. No one wants to die. Even people who want to go to heaven don't want to die to get there. And yet, death is a destination we all share. No one has ever escaped it. And that is as it should be because death is very likely the single best invention of life. It is life's change agent. It clears out the old to make way for the new. Right now, the new is you, but someday, not too long from now, you will gradually become the old and be cleared away. 
Sorry to be dramatic, but it is quite true. Your time is limited, so don't waste it living someone else's life. Don't be trapped by dogma, which is living with the results of other people's thinking. Don't let the noise of others' opinions drone out your own inner voice. And most important, have the courage to follow your heart and intuition. They somehow already know what you truly want to become. Everything else is secondary. I love this number four. Stay hungry, stay foolish. I used to share this with my students when I was teaching at the National University. When I was young, there was an amazing publication called The Whole Earth Catalog, which was one of the Bibles of my generation. It was created by a fellow named Stuart Brand, not far from here in Menlo Park, and he brought it to life with his poetic touch. This was in the late 1960s because personal computers and desktop publishing, so it was all made with typewriters, scissors, and Polaroid cameras. It was sort of like Google in paperback form. 35 years before Google came along, it was idealistic and overflowing with neat tools and great notions. Stuart and his team put out several issues of the whole Earth catalog, and then when it had run its first course, they put out a final issue. It was the mid-1970s, and I was your age. On the back cover of the final issue was a photograph of an early morning country road, the kind you might find yourself hitchhiking on if you were so adventurous. Beneath it were the words, stay hungry, stay foolish. It was their farewell message as they signed off, stay hungry, stay foolish. And I have always wished that for myself. And now, as you graduate to begin anew, I wish that for you. Stay hungry, stay foolish. Number five, take longer view on people. I believe we have to help our people. We have to support them. We have to unleash their potentials, their strengths. Good question. I'm not sure I learned this when I was at Apple, but I learned it based on the data when I was at Apple. Uh, and that is, I now take a longer term view on people. In other words, when I see something not being done right, my first reaction isn't to go fix it. Um, it's to say, we're building a team here and we're going to do great stuff for the next decade, not just the next year. And so what do I need to do to help so that the person that's screwing up learns versus how do I fix the problem? And uh, that's painful sometimes. And, my, and I still have that first instinct to go fix the problem. But that's taking a longer term view on people. This number six is very powerful focus. Remember Pareto principle, or the 80-20 principle, that you need to focus on the vital few for you to get the maximum efficiency, or for you to get the maximum output. I've, uh, I've been back about uh, eight to 10 weeks, and uh, we've been working really hard. Uh, and what we're trying to do uh, is, is not something really highfalutin. We're, we're trying to get back to the basics. Uh, we're trying to get back to the basics of great products, great marketing, and great distribution. Uh, and I think that, that Apple has, has pockets of greatness, but in some ways has drifted away from, from doing the basics really well. So we started um, with the product line. We looked at the product roadmap going out for a few years, and we said a lot of this doesn't make sense, and it's way too much stuff, and there's not enough focus. And so we actually got rid of 70% of the stuff on the product roadmap. I mean, I couldn't even figure out the damn product line after a few weeks. I, I kept saying, well, what is this model? How does this fit? And I started talking to customers, and they couldn't figure it out either. And so you're going to see the product line get much simpler, and you're going to see the product line get much better. And there's some new stuff coming out that's incredibly nice. Uh, in addition, we've been able to focus a lot more on the 30% of the gems and add some new stuff in that is going to take us in some whole new directions. Number seven, people with passion can change the world for the better, and they do. But Apple's about something more than that. Apple, at the core, its core value 
is that we believe that people with passion can change the world for the better. That's what we believe. And we've had the opportunity to work with people like that. We've had an opportunity to work with people like you, with software developers, with customers who have done it in some big and some small ways. And we believe that in this world. People can change it for the better. And that those people that are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones that actually do. Number eight, stick to your core values. Whatever it is that you want to decide on, you always have to check your values. Those values are your compass, whatever it is that you want to do in your life. Is to, is to get back to that core value. A lot of things have changed. The market's a totally different place than it was a decade ago. And Apple's totally different, and Apple's place in it is totally different. And believe me, the products and the distribution strategy and the manufacturing are totally different, and we understand that. But values and core values, those things shouldn't change. The things that Apple believed in at its core are the same things that Apple really stands for today. Number nine, think different. I know every one of us has different perspectives in looking at things, looking at the problem, looking at the situation. But if we keep on challenging each other, challenging to think differently, I believe we can arrive on a maximized or optimized solution. The theme of the campaign is, is think different. It's the people honoring the people who think different and who move this world forward. And it's, it is what we are about. It touches the soul of this company. So I'm going to go ahead and roll it, uh, and I hope that you feel the same way about it I do. Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs and scoop. Ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules, and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them. Now, the only thing you can't do is ignore them. Because they change things. They push the human race forward. And while some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. And number 10, life can be much broader. In everything that we do, we always have to challenge the status quo. We always have to think of what else can we do. Our life is more than just watching Netflix, or studying, or working. There are so many things that we can do in life. We have to maximize our talents, and we have to maximize our existence. When you grow up, you tend to get told that the world is the way it is, and your, your life is just to live your life inside the world, try not to bash into the walls too much, uh, uh, try to have a nice family life, uh, have fun, save a little money. Um, but life, that's a very limited life. Life can be much broader once you discover one simple fact, and that is everything around you that you call life was made up by people that were no smarter than you. And you can change it. You can influence it. You can, you can build your own things that other people can use. And the minute that you understand that you can poke life and actually something will, you know, if you push in, something will pop out the other side, that you can, you can change it, you can mold it, um, that's maybe the most important thing, is to shake off this, uh, th this uh, erroneous notion that life is, is there and you're just going to live in it, versus embrace it, change it, improve it, make your mark upon it. Um, I, I think that's very important. And however you learn that, once you learn it, uh, you'll want to change life and make it better because it's kind of messed up in a lot of ways. Um, once you learn that, you'll never be the same again. And that's all it for today. I hope you learned something. Thank you so much, Steve Jeffs, for this very nice product.
Stay safe, happy, gritty, and healthy. Bye-bye!